And so the next part of the evening is to introduce Professor <coughs> Harper. And again, uh, like Timothy Garton, Ash, Sarah Harper, the polymath, um, whose uh, work spans both academia and journalism and many other spheres. And um, I think if I were to read out all the distinctions this evening, we'd still be here for breakfast tomorrow morning. But suffice to say uh, that she's by background an anthropologist. Um, she is also a, a gerontologist, which is somebody who studies the science of aging, uh, and demographer. And she's published very widely in, in those areas. Um, as Professor of Gerontology at Oxford University, she's also the founding director of the Oxford Institute of Population and Aging, about which maybe she can tell you a little bit more. She's also an advisor both to the UK government and many foreign governments on questions of democracy and population movement, and is on the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. Um, and uh, on top of all that, she has been involved both in uh, print and television journalism. She has <coughs> many uh, distinctions, including CBE, for her uh, wide-ranging work. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Um, and I have to say that um, I didn't actually knew, know you existed until I met Peter. Uh, and once I learned about you, and then he said, would I come and speak? Um, I thought this would be a fantastic opportunity to actually look at some facts and figures. And so Peter said, when I talk about the evidence uh, about the population of Europe and the population of the UK and how it's going to change uh, should Brexit um, come through. Uh, and I was very uh, touched by um, something that Timothy said right at the beginning um, about how he described himself. And I have just been um, working in Paris for the last year. Uh, and for the very first time in my life, when people ask me what passport I have, I say I have a European passport. I think that's actually very much backed up by survey material, which shows that there are now far more people in the UK who identify as European than ever before. So if it should be that Brexit didn't happen, then I think we're all aware that both statistically and probably emotionally, uh, our involvement in Europe should increase uh, quite dramatically. So I'm a demographer, um, and I look at falling fertility rates across the world, falling mortality rates across the world, which means we're all living longer, but also as the balancing act between births and deaths, uh, and that's actually migration. So I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the role of migration and how Britain uh, came into being. Um, I think there's a real tension at the moment, and it's been a very positive tension for the last 40 years. Uh, in particular, as we stood on that balance between being members of a big Commonwealth of Nations, that was the Commonwealth, uh, and increasingly our regional group of nations. And I think it was a very successful balance, uh, and we did identify as a nation globally with our Commonwealth and regionally uh, with Europe. And obviously in, in the past few years that emphasis has um, been changed for us, uh, really without many people many, many people wanting that. If we just go back um, and look at what happened to the UK, we know there have been these waves of migration into the UK. So basically, for about a thousand years, we were formed by the Romans, by the Vikings, by the Saxons, and then by the Normans. Um, and I think there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence from looking at our culture and names as to how mixed we were with our European neighbours. Um, if I just look at my own uh, surnames, if I take my grandmother's surnames, uh, they are Harper, Clare, Scott and Endersby. But I'm completely English. I can trace on both sides of my family back about four or five hundred years. And yet, Harper and Clare are Norman names. Scott is presumably Scottish. Uh, and Endersby is actually Endersby, and it is Danish. And really interestingly, the, the Danish family has stayed within some settlements outside Cambridge uh, since 1485, and we have a direct line. So I'm completely English, but I'm also very European. And I don't know whether you went to that wonderful exhibition on the Ashmolean, which looked at migrants and settlements. If you didn't, just go onto the web um, and Google. I think it's called uh, Settlements, Geography and Genes. 
And for the very first time, they have mapped the UK genome. Uh, and they can really show genetically where we come from. And it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, the English are genetically actually very different uh, from the Scots and the Welsh, which is, and actually also from the Cornish, which is interesting. But if you look at the Scottish population, uh, quite a large percentage of the Scottish genome is Norwegian, and that's the Viking influx. If you look at the English genome, a large percentage, relatively, of our genome is actually German, and that comes from the Saxon. But across the UK, we all have quite a large percentage of genetic material from France. So genetically, we really are linked into our region, uh, and we've got the evidence now uh, to show that. And that's because we've always had some kind of a migration. And in fact, international migration has been at roughly 3% uh, of uh, our population uh, for uh, many, many um, centuries now. We've tended to send people out, but we've also obviously had people uh, come in. And we have very, very good data. Uh, we really now understand uh, where our population, our migrant population has come from. And I just thought I'd just go through uh, where our migrant population has come from. And you may be surprised because it's actually slightly different from some of the public rhetoric uh, that we've heard. If we look back 10 years ago, uh, then overwhelmingly the majority of migrants as a group in this country are Indians, roughly 700,000 uh, of non-British born people. Uh, are Indian, and that's exactly the same as the number of Poles we have. So, uh, 700,000 British, uh, non-British, sorry, Indian-born Indians and Poles uh, a decade ago. Uh, and then we had the Pakistanis and the Germans. They also were equal. Uh, we had as many French in this country as we did Kenyans. We had as many Bulgarians as Japanese. And we had as many Romanians as Canadians. So this idea that we have this massive influx of people from Eastern Europe, just statistically, uh, isn't quite that accurate. Now, obviously, the Eastern Europeans increased coming into uh, the country, but even at the time of the referendum, and 2016 is, is, is where uh, I, I will stop, because things have got complex uh, after that. Still, the biggest overseas-born group in this country was divided between the Indians and the Poles, then came the Pakistanis, then came uh, the Irish, and interestingly, we have seen quite a decline uh, in the, the German population. So we did have not only culturally and socially a wonderful balance between Europe and the Commonwealth, but also statistically in terms of the number of people uh, that we had. So what do these migrants do? Why are they taking away our jobs or why are they contributing to our society? Well, in 2016, uh, again, um, at the year uh, of the referendum, half um, of all our processing in this country was done by non-British born peoples. So particularly food processing, but also manufacturing uh, processing uh, as well. Um, a third of our hospitality and cleaning was done by uh, immigrants, and a quarter of all our IT work, and remarkably our healthcare, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit uh, at the end, except in London, where 50% of all healthcare workers were non-British born. Huge contribution at all levels uh, to our society. But if we actually just take the EU, uh, as opposed to migrants in general, one statistic I find quite extraordinary is that the number of managerial and professional people who came uh, into this country, roughly 25% of EU migrants were managerial and professional, is very similar to British-born managerial and professional. That's roughly 30% of the British population. So we also benefited from very, very highly skilled uh, uh, immigrants when we look at our EU population. So what has happened since then? Um, we've seen roughly a 70% decline uh, in EU migrants coming in, and we've seen a 25% increase in non-EU migrants. So we have shifted our migrant population away from our region back to our Commonwealth. And that balance isn't necessarily good uh, for the skills that we need in this country. And again, I'm going to talk in a minute about healthcare and skills and other things. So we talk quite a lot um, about young people, and I think this really is where um, looking forward uh, is most concerning from a demographic point of view. 
Um, in particular, there have been so many programmes that have benefited British uh, young people. Um, just to take one, the Erasmus programme, 9 million uh, Europeans, including uh, a large number of British people who have been able to go overseas uh, within Europe uh, for their education. And many people are not aware of something called Erasmus Plus, which started in 2015, uh, and nearly 3 million Europeans who work in apprenticeships and volunteering and the transition from education into work have all been able to benefit uh, from this uh, community. And I think what is very clear is when we look at the survey material, and you'll all be aware of this, uh, many young people obviously not only want to stay, but when I look at my own undergraduates, what is particularly clear is before 2016, even the concept of a nation was being questioned by this generation. And that generation were beginning to ask, why do we have boundaries based on the country uh, in which we are born? Uh, we also increasingly know that we have actually mobile uh, work, uh, and indeed there was a big move uh, about things like taxation, where we have so many people who are now working in the country of which they don't have their nationality. But the biggest thing, I think, is if we look at what is going to happen to the UK demographically. So the UK, along with other European countries, in fact all high income countries, is ageing. We're ageing very quickly, we have fewer young people, a shrinking uh, workforce and an increasingly older population. But surprisingly, there are two countries within Europe that are particularly young, and they are the UK and France. And that is because they, in particular, have until now always encouraged young workers uh, to come in and they have kept themselves demographically young because of that. Uh, and I think, going back to my subject, gerontology, if we look at what is going to happen to the NHS and healthcare in general, at the very time when our population is ageing and we're having increasing numbers and percentages of older adults, we're dramatically reducing our healthcare workers our doctors, our nurses, our home care workers. And going forward, we uh, did some work which was published in The Guardian just after the referendum. The reality for people in this country is if Brexit stops the kind of freedom of movement that we have all experienced, then everybody, as they come up to retirement, are going to have to work 18 months longer simply to compensate from the decline in immigrants. So that's a very factual view of the population, uh, but it's one that is actually based on evidence uh, rather than rhetoric. Thank you. Well, absolutely fantastic, and thank you for that. And I think it, it just exemplifies how many myths there are, which is our our job to explode and myths about population movement and the, um, the mantra bending free movement. I think above all uh, we need to challenge whenever we hear them. 